Hello and welcome to Raise Your Average. I'm Pierre Daly, Managing Editor at AdvisorAnalyst.com. My co-hosts are Mike Philbrick and Adam Butler from Resolve Asset Management. Our very special guest is Phil Huber, Chief Investment Officer for Savant Wealth Management. Phil leads the firm's investment and portfolio management related functions. He's the author of the recently published book and tour de force, The Allocator's Edge, a modern guide to alternative investments and the future of diversification. Phil has made a name for himself as a regular on and in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Investment News, CityWire, RIA Magazine, and Bloomberg, and was named one of Investopedia's top 100 financial advisors from 2018 to 2020. He also authors a popular investing blog, Bips and Pieces, and is active on Twitter and LinkedIn. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Phil, welcome to the show. It's really great to have you. It's great to be here. Thank you, gentlemen, for the warm introduction and for having me on today. Excited about this conversation, actually. It's very timely. Um, Phil, to kick things off, please tell us about the arc of your career, your background, uh, how and why you got into the business in the first place, and what you're focused on these days at Savant Wealth Management. Sure. Um, I got interested in the wealth management space, you know, really just by growing up around it. Uh, my father was and is a financial advisor still. And so he founded a, a registered investment advisor in the Chicago area back in the late 80s um, and grew that um, over time. And, and so I was just, you know, always knew that he loved and, and enjoyed his job very much. And so it always seemed like a, a, an appealing career path to me. And I I think I just kind of gravitated towards finance and investing. Those were subjects that I, I found very interesting and, and worth studying. And so I, I majored in finance through college and um, had an inkling that at some point I would join the family business. And, and I did so pretty early on in, in my career. So um, I spent a, you know about 13 years at, at that prior firm, which was Huber Financial Advisors. Uh, eventually we you know grew to a size of about a billion and a half in assets under management. Uh, we had a, just under 30 employees, and so we were, we were a decent-sized uh, advisory firm, but we ultimately decided uh, in early 2020, just about a month before the pandemic hit, we, we've uh, closed our, our merger with Savant, uh, where I am now. And so, uh, you know, we, we had known Savant for uh, many years as kind of a neighbor that, you know, kind of in our backyard. We were North Chicago. Uh, Savant is based in Rockford, Illinois, which is a little over an hour away. And so both firms had had a long standing kind of knowledge of one another and mutual admiration. And we thought, hey, I think there's enough uh, good things that each side is doing that we could do more better together than, than separately. And so we joined up forces and uh, I, I had been in the CIO role at Huber. And so that was a natural, uh, you know, kind of adaptation for me to, to move over to Savant and take on that role. And it's been a great experience so far. We're, you know, nearly two years into the the deal post close and it's been a great to to join a larger enterprise and be able to affect more lives and um uh it's been, it's been a lot of fun i can't believe it's been two years <laughs> that it feels like it's wild you just announced that like last week man I, you know it, it's it weird just... how i mean just the the two years last year, year and a half to two years in general there, there's days i'll wake up and it feels like it was like 10 years ago and then other times it feels like it was yesterday <laughs> well this is the yeah. year and a half or so that feels like a decade i guess so um yeah <laughs> yeah really I I that makes more consider sense. that it has been yeah. a, sort of a warped existence for the last yeah, two years yeah, I, I think yeah. we all lost what you know sense of time and what time means <laughs> you were playing a similar role at your previous firm right when you were um, at your own RIA, and obviously it was it was considerably smaller than the you know the current purview of your role. Um, how Correct. has your framework shifted as you moved into a capacity where you're now just you know not just uh, informing the portfolios or guiding the portfolios for your small um, group of clients, but rather for other advisors who are then guiding portfolios for their clients, do you think? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, while the role I have today versus at Huber is identical in title, the, the actual kind of day-to-day -day responsibilities are a little bit different. On one hand, I'm, I'm wearing fewer hats today than I than I did at, at Huber Financial, where, where where I you know was focused on the investment side, but was doing a fair amount of my own you know one-on-one -on -one client work with uh, as an advisor in, in a certain capacity, and you know had my hands in different areas of management of the firm as part of the the management committee. Um, and, and so that's one aspect. The other aspect is I was never accustomed to having a large team. I usually had, you know, maybe one or two uh, analyst tops uh, supporting me at, at Huber Financial, whereas at Savant, we've got a pretty, you know, deep bench of investment talent across our, our research team. And so I've got uh, a counterpart, Gina Beal. She's our director of research and is based remotely in San Diego. And she and I uh, co-lead the, the department and the analysts that, that uh, support us, as well as co-chair the investment committee for the firm. And so I think that's been a, an, an interesting and fun experience of just kind of working within a, a larger investment team uh, and also just being more kind of focused and deliberate in what I do and not being spread too thin. And so kind of shedding some of the responsibilities, you know, that I used to have, like one example would be kind of oversight of trading and day-to-day -day mm -hmm. portfolio management. We have a, just a separate trading function that, that, that does all that. And so that was, you know, something that I sort of relinquished and, and really, you know, when I, when I think of the role of a CIO in a wealth management firm and what the responsibilities are like, yeah, they're, they're, uh, a big part of it is setting investment policy and manager research and due diligence and all those things that go into the how we construct portfolios, what types of investment products that we use. But, you know, really specifically, my role is, is very much communication is first and foremost, you know, uh, the biggest part of my role. And that comes in many different forms. Some of it's, you know, one on one interaction with advisors and their clients or, or prospects. Um, other times it's, it's, you know, written communication or webinars or podcasts or, or you know, all, all sorts of different ways to reach an audience of one or an audience of many. And so I think, you know, we, we have our portfolios, but as we grow as a firm, like I, I you know, I, I view the department that I oversee as really a centralized resources uh, or centralized resource for the advisors at the firm. And so, whereas at, you know, at my prior firm, it was, mm -hmm maybe 10 or so advisors that I was supporting. Now it's, you know, over 70. And so we have to be smart about how we um, communicate communicate to our, our internal audience as well as our external audience. And also we're growing, you know, pretty, you know, healthy clip and we're, you know, we've been acquiring other firms, you know, even since I joined, not even two years ago, we've since acquired three other advisory firms. So we're constantly adding new advisors to the fold. And, uh, you know, it, it, I would say generally speaking, the, the firms that we're, engaging with and partnering with tend to be firms that have a decent amount of philosophical overlap in terms of, you know, how, you know, the investment side of the business. And so, but at the same time, every, every firm does things differently. So there's very much more involvement than I'm, than I was used to in my prior role of, you know, training and educating the advisors that are joining Savant of here's how we do things a little bit differently than you did at your prior firm. Here's how to tell our story to your, to your clients, just because, you know, our objective is not to have a national presence and a bunch of random offices across the country where each office is kind of responsible for their own, you know, investment approach. The idea is that we've got a, a centralized investment philosophy and approach that all of our advisors, regardless of what city or state they're in uh, or what office location, they're tapping into that. And so we're creating a consistent experience for our client base, um, kind of one firm, one philosophy. And so um, that's a big part now too, is just that kind of that onboarding and integration of new, uh, new partner firms. To what extent do you think your experience as a, you know, on the ground advisor dealing one-on-one -on -one with clients, um, feeds into your ability to communicate with advisors at a level that is connected to their day-to-day -day experience? I think it's tremendously important that I do have that background because it's, I, I think at times like advisors, they, they want us to, as, as the research team to be empathetic to what they're dealing with on the front lines and what their conversations with clients are, are looking like. I think it's a little, you know, so it, it can be challenging if you're a research analyst and you're really just kind of focused on like, here's what the numbers say, here's what works in a spreadsheet versus here's what works in real life. Like at the end of the day, you know, as we all know, the best portfolio is the one that the clients can stick with. And so I think we need to strike a good balance between, you know, what we think is the optimal set of portfolios that we build on paper versus the ones that we think our advisors will have the, the confidence to deliver to the clients and the clients 
will be able to tolerate the experience of holding uh, to their own you know, investment success. And so um, part of how we try to achieve that is through the construction of our investment committee. And so, you know, there's a couple other eggheads on the committee like myself that are the, the CFA types that, that really, you know, spend their, their livelihood on, you know, researching investments and that's where their passion is. But we also have uh, membership from our executive team on the investment committee, as well as uh, some of our senior financial advisors. So our CEO sits on the committee, our COO sits on the committee. And, and then what we do with advisors is we say, you know, we think it's a good experience for, for advisors to have like a tour of duty on the investment committee so they get a better feeling of what goes into the decision-making process mm -hmm. in the firm and how we, we build our, our portfolios. Um, but it doesn't have to be a permanent, you know, membership. And so what we tend to do is, you know, call it have one, you know, advisor spends one to three years on the committee. Um, and we think that's valuable for them. And so eventually they rotate off. We bring someone else on. And so over a longer period of time, you ultimately try to get you know, a decent number of your advisors having some involvement and input into that committee uh, structure and, and different projects that we have going on. So I think it really is valuable to have kind of three lenses um, when it, in, in that decision making uh, group, one from the executive kind of business side of, of the, the equation, one from the, the strict kind of research side, and then the other from the client facing side. And so um, I think that really helps ultimately you know, get everybody on the same page and, and feel that we've got the best solutions that we can put in front of our clients. And I'm guessing it's uh, pretty reassuring for the advisors that you that you talk to that that you're a former advisor, right? Yeah, and I, and I still work with clients and, and a big part of my role is just making myself available when there's a need for an advisor that may want me to sit in on a, you know, what used to be an in-person meeting now, now typically via Zoom. Uh, or something like that but yeah I, I love that stuff like you know as much as I am fond of, of writing blog posts and you know of course like some things like the book like I, I really get a lot of pleasure of just sitting down with like with the actual clients and people that we that we serve that's really important to me to just uh, have that be a, a big part of my role and so um, I'm always happy to do that when, when it's appropriate and I think the advisors like that too you know even if not in every meeting it's just like Hey, for the clients that are that like to dig deep around the investment portfolio and have the discussion kind of more centered on, on stuff there, um, you know, the, it might go beyond a certain level of depth that they might not be comfortable with that I'm happy to come in and, and, and share. Yeah, so, I mean, I, often I, I hear uh, about advisors getting upset with companies trying to tell them how to do their business or how they should turn their business over or change things or become you know, whatever, whether, <laughs> you know, and, and it's a very egotistical business, right? And, and uh, high conviction business. So when someone comes along who, who hasn't got the experience, you know, the immediate reaction is, is, you know, what do you know about being an advisor? But so it's nice to be in, it's, it's, you know, it's, it must be a significant advantage. Um, I'm sure, Adam, you feel that way too, right? So, and yeah, uh, it definitely is helpful yeah. to have had a few years experience communicating these concepts with clients because it's easy to live out in the sort of nebulous um, lexicons and, and concept space that, that we deal with as kind of people who are passionate about the markets and investment concepts, but, and then forget that most people do not live and breathe these terms and these ideas and, and um, what's going on day to day in markets around the world. So it's, it helps to, be connected with that. And I think you're right, Pierre, in some ways, it does, it does give you a little bit more credibility with advisors that they know that you've been in their shoes for, um, for many years and can therefore kind of empathize with, with the experience they're having with clients. Right. So I yeah, think it's a good point. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's the type of experience that we try to get all of our analysts, to, you know, to, to varying degrees. We want, we want them to get that client facing exposure, even if it's on, you know, even if they're not doing it as frequently as I might be doing, I think it's important for their own development that they understand what it's like to be sitting down with a family who's entrusted us with their their money and, and really know what those, you know, what that advisor experience is like. Because I think it'll help them be better analysts and just be more appreciative of the, the work that we do. Um, and then similarly, I think it's important to just have a constant feedback loop between our department and the advisory, you know, leadership team to just check in periodically, like, hey, like what... You know, sometimes we'll we'll do actual formal surveys. We send out like a survey monkey and, and have ask some ask some questions because it's good for us to have our finger on the pulse of like what are the topics that are coming up most frequently in your client meetings. 
Are there any gaps in our investment menu that we should be exploring? And so just like continually, you know, asking those types of questions only will help inform our research agenda, the content we produce to try to make it as useful and timely uh, as possible when they're sitting down with clients. Uh, so that's, that's a big part of our process. Are, are there well. any, are there any uh, points of note recently as you've, as you've, you know, you published the Allocator's Edge, a modern guide to alternative investments in the future of diversification. So I want to make sure we get the, the title out there because I think it's informative as to what that book represents and how it actually dovetails into everything that you've been talking about up to this point, right? You've got uh, you've got an investment thesis. You've got advisors that have got to convey that to clients who have to own it and keep it in order to uh, benefit from the long-term results of that. So thinking about that, it, you've, you've written the book, you've, you've had it out there for a while and, um, and we'll dig into some of the other points of it, but is there anything that's come up in this where you're like, Oh, I, I should have written another chapter or there's a piece missing, or, you know, the, here's actually where the conversations are leading given th this new information or this compendium of information that I've provided the world. Yeah, it's funny. So we we did. I mentioned that survey earlier, and this is probably several months ago. Maybe it's a kind of summer, summertime that we sent this out. But you know, it was an open-ended question. Like, what's the what are the most common things coming up in your client meetings? And it was almost funny, and it kind of joked. Like, it was far and away the number one topic was inflation. Clients worried about inflation. Maybe second to that was, you know, markets, stock markets at all-time highs, elevated valuations. Call that the second work concern. Third concern. How do I invest in a low yield world? <laughs> and then the fourth concern, why do I own these alternatives in the portfolio? Yeah. Which I thought was just hilarious because when you think of like <laughs> those first three kind of pain points or concerns. It kind of answers itself. Ultimately, <laughs> ultimately that, that fourth question, like that's why we have the alternative. So what, what it told me was A, well then we probably need to be doing a better job of how we, what, what our messaging looks like. Because so, if that's, you know, obviously performance is always going to drive things in the short term. So that's probably causing some of the, pain points around alternatives and that that more line items you have in a portfolio there's always going to be this likelihood that at least one of them is is underperforming at a given time and so um but at the same time you know if our purpose of adding in these non-traditional diversifying return sources into the portfolio is to address those very concerns of potentially high and rising inflation of uh elevated stock market valuations and and trying to find diversification when bonds are offering offering you very little in in the uh, the scope of yield and, and total return, you know, that's why we're we're introducing some of these other asset classes to the portfolio. So I think we a it was informative to us that we need to really kind of unify this messaging a bit better. But it also made me excited that you know this was in, in advance of the book coming out. I'm like, oh, this is perfect timing. And so what I'm excited about is really taking uh, all the concepts in the book, um, which you know again it's it's a you know a thicker read, and it was really written more towards financial advisors and, and investment professionals. We're certainly going to introduce it to clients and, and, you know, make it available to clients as, as much as we can. Um, but I think, you know, not every client's going to want to sit down and read a 300 page book on alternative investments. It's probably not their idea of spending a, a fun weekend. And so I'm, what I'm excited about is how do I take all the concepts in there and adapt it to other, you know, content that we're doing short, you know, shorter type type pieces, you know, PowerPoint presentations for webinars, things like that. So, so we're, we're actively working on different ways we can kind of adapt the book to other mediums to try to like, you know, introduce that messaging and really pound home. Like this is, this is why we feel very strongly about this, this strategic component of your portfolio. And here's how we can kind of better translate that to our end clients that again, let's try to get, remove as much of the lexicon and jargon as possible and try to simplify what's inherently a complex playing field. What do you what do you think is the uh, biggest problem with alternatives, Phil? Oh, I think you know there's a couple of things that that come up with clients. I think you know clients have grown very accustomed to their stock and bond funds having like rock bottom expenses. That's been the prevailing trend of the past you know decade plus of the shift towards passive and towards indexing, where you can own you know broad stock and bond markets at very very cheaply, and so when they start to see new funds added to the mix that have, you know, decently higher expense ratios, like naturally some of them, you know, kind of just pose the question like, Hey, I'm, you know, you get, you guys have advocated, you know, low cost funds, et cetera. These, these seem a bit higher. What's, what's the trade off? Why are these kind of, you know, quote worth it? Whereas 
maybe you don't you're not willing to pay up for us you know large cap stock exposure and so i think that's a conversation that we need to have and kind of educate getting them on hey just low cost isn't the be all end all there's a time and a place for things that are moderate to higher cost it's just thinking about them and contextualizing when is it appropriate to, to pay up for something in a portfolio relative to the expected benefits you you assume you're going to receive so so cost is one thing and i think Second, it was just everyone's kind of used to owning stocks and used to owning bonds, and so they're familiar with the experience. Whereas, depending on the alternative category, it's just, you know a, a bit more novel or foreign uh, to the average client. So I think just uh, you know uh, setting expectations for people and educating them, you know, in a in a way they can understand. Of here's what this asset class is. Here's why we're introducing it. Here's why you should expect to make money over time. Here's an environment where it may do well. Here's an environment where it may do poorly. Here's maybe what to expect from a kind of hypothetical, you know, worst case scenario standpoint. And so trying to just kind of give them a little bit of context on the role in the portfolio, where we're, where we're sourcing it from, what we're expecting to get out of it versus just sticking with the status quo. So, um, it, you know, these aren't insurmountable, you know, objections, but I think they're just, you know, things that clients should be asking when that when something new gets introduced is, hey, what is this? Why do I own it? Why? <laughs> Why is it worth the extra costs involved? And so that's, that's you know, again, we just got to be armed and prepared uh, to answer those questions when they come up. I think it's helpful, too, to think about the overall cost in, in the context of the entire portfolio as well, right? So if, if you have mitigated a lot of the costs in, in, in beta exposures, let's say, and you've got that down to several basis points, adding those um, alternatives that cost a little bit more, from a portfolio perspective, the overall portfolio cost isn't rising as much, um, yet the diversification benefit and the opportunity to rebalance is enhanced uh, quite dramatically. And, and I would also add that, you know, if, if we go back through time and look at Yale and the endowment there, just as a, as a simple example of the adoption of equities as a core part of a portfolio. You know, when you go into sort of the uh, late 80s, early 90s, most of those portfolios were dominated by bonds. And then they brought in stocks. And the boomers uh, certainly brought in this idea of regularly saving into equity markets uh, over over time as a means to prepare for and save for, um, you know, their long-term obligations. That didn't really exist in the 70s and for a good part of the 80s to be quite mm -hmm. honest, like the, it, it was something that the uh, Overton window of acceptance sort of has has um, encouraged over the last 20 or 30 years. And one does have to think about, you know, we are getting at the mass, max saturation potentially of that. I mean, how many more um, endowment portfolios can go from zero equity to some amount of equity, and, and some of them have gone on to private mm -hmm. equity and whatnot. But I think it it pays investors and allocators and advisors to think about that as a means of you know preparing for a future that may be a little bit different than the past twenty or thirty years. And I think too, I mean, the, this this notion that like sixty forty was always the way to build a balanced portfolio that's not always the case. The the way investors go about you know investing is, is constantly evolving if you just look throughout history like and and largely it's a function of a few things it's it's a technology just making things either easier to implement or, or introducing new fund structures i think you know a good example just like the <clears throat> etf like 1993 i think was the first etf like that's still a relative new relatively new fund structure and today we have trillions of dollars allocated to, to etfs and so the, the idea that you could go out and buy you know, in one fund, something that owns like 2000 stocks or something you couldn't just from a technological standpoint, that wasn't even possible in the 1950s. So it's like on one hand, you have technology improving and that affects product development. On the other hand, you also have just collectively our understanding of like what what makes a good portfolio and what how what are the kind of best ways to combine things for certain types of outcomes or objectives. You know, that thinking and that understanding evolves over time and continues to improve. Um, and, and so you see that kind of evolution over time of um, things that were once sort of, you know, main, or not mainstream, but novel or, or a bit in their infancy become mainstream over time. And so the same goes for alternatives. You see new asset classes have emerged in, in prior decades that 
ultimately got kind of gained broader adoption. So it, it won't surprise me that to see a handful of the chapters that I cover in the book that might be a bit foreign to investors today to become you know more broadly accepted as time goes on. And I think too, one, one area that I think will be in particular become more pronounced is just the, the acceptance and introduction of non-daily liquid investments into portfolios as more and more products become available. I think that's become kind of a default for, for many investors and advisors over the years is just using daily liquid mutual funds and ETFs and, and other structures. Whereas I think you're seeing kind of a middle ground uh, of, of a handful of um, registered funds that have episodic or periodic liquidity windows where it's kind of a, an interesting middle ground between like your kind of registered, you know, daily liquid mutual funds at one extreme versus the other extreme, which is, you know, limited partnership, long time lockup, and that might not be appropriate for, you know, a lot of clients for, for certain reasons as well. So I think having that kind of middle ground where you can introduce things that are a bit less liquid, but not have to go completely into the, uh, you know, the LP space to do so. Well, why don't we dive into the um, different alternative asset uh, strategies that you cover in the book? And maybe since you just mentioned it, maybe we start with interval funds and what they are. And um, um, I don't think they have direct analogs in Canada, but I still think that the Canadian audience would be interested in the types of strategies that are offered in interval funds and maybe um, why the structure is well suited to those strategies. Yeah, so, so I guess apologies for, for any of this that doesn't necessarily translate to the, the Canadian audience, but for, for U.S. investors, this interval fund structure is um, essentially, you know, 1940 Act registered funds where as opposed to being able to buy and sell on a daily basis and redeem and get liquidity uh, on that short of notice, um, on the sell side, there's uh, quarterly repurchase uh, windows uh, for interval funds where essentially you would submit your redemption requests, you know, at the assigned date in each quarter. Um, and then depending on the amount of redemptions, you either get all of your capital requested back or a portion of it. And so um, as much as there are those quarterly windows, we, we definitely kind of want to treat them as as long-term, more illiquid investments because that, that liquidity is not guaranteed. And the reason that can not be guaranteed is, that, is the uh, interval fund managers are required to purchase up to 5% of outstanding assets each quarter. But if redemption requests exceed that 5%, then your your request will get prorated. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of submitting $100 and getting 100 back, maybe you submit 100 and you get 75 back or something along those lines. And so it could, you know, you, you, there's, a, there's a chance that you might not be able to get all of your money out. So should you desire to get it out uh, for, for a fairly long period of time, depending on how long a gate is imposed. And so that is one unique feature about interval funds that makes them distinct from mutual funds and ETFs. But then when you look at the uh, common attributes to those, you know, pretty widely used fund wrappers, um, it checks a lot of the boxes of what, what investors in the U.S. kind of like from a convenience standpoint in that um, it's 1099 tax reporting as opposed to K-1. Uh, there's daily NAVs, and so you, you get pricing updates on a daily basis. They have ticker symbols. Um, that they're kind of registered under the 1940 Act, which kind of from a regulatory oversight standpoint, I think is important to, uh, to many people. And so it kind of, in many ways, looks and feels and smells like a mutual fund with that key distinction on the liquidity side. And the reason that is there is because um, daily liquid mutual funds have a cap on how much they can hold in illiquid investments in the portfolio. And so for certain asset classes, things like private debt or certain types of real assets or catastrophe reinsurance. There's a handful of categories that you can, you know, effectively do inside of an interval fund using these illiquid investments that you really can't do uh, properly inside of a daily liquid fund. And so I think it's a nice kind of middle ground. Um, you know, again, there, there are risks involved and in, in illiquidity potentially, but I think for investors that have the kind of appetite and bandwidth to open up a portion of their portfolio to non-daily liquid, it can introduce some, some, you know, fairly compelling diversification opportunities. Yeah, makes sense. So what are some of the other popular alternatives that you cover um, in the book and maybe start with ones that you're um, more likely to recommend nowadays in the current environment? Yeah, so the, the I, my aim with the, the book was to really make it as comprehensive as possible in terms of the, the kind of asset class and strategy coverage 
And so that's really that whole second part of the book. And, you know, the, the book itself is really structured into three parts. And I kind of very simply like to think of those as the why, the what, and the how. So part one, the three chapters there is just why should I be investing in alternatives? Part two, what are the different types of alternatives there are? Part three, how? What, how do I think about building portfolios and effectively communicating to them to my clients? Um, and so that middle section, I thought it just naturally made sense to follow a past, present, and future framework from a chapter standpoint. And so when I think about what are like the big four, what are like the four horsemen of alternatives, the, the asset class is that when you just say the word alternative in people's head, they start to conjure up these, these areas. And to me, that's private equity, hedge funds, real estate, and natural resources, uh, you know, specifically like gold and commodities, because those tend to be what, what dominate most institutional alternative portfolios. And so I thought naturally it made sense to start there and just kind of briefly touch on those areas uh, before kind of moving forward to the more, some of the more modern or less familiar types of alternatives that are in the book. And so other categories include, uh, there's a whole chapter on alternative risk premia, uh, which I just sort of loosely define as systematic uh, approaches to hedge fund strategies. Um, another chapter after that is on insurance linked security. So I mentioned earlier, uh, catastrophe reinsurance, that, that's, that's that asset class, which is a really unique diversifier. <laughs> And then there's real assets. And so, you know, real estate, which, you know, is alluded to earlier, that's one type of real asset, but there's other categories uh, that can be looked at as well. Things like infrastructure, farmland, timberland, um, cr private credits becoming a, a, a very large category as well, alongside the, the growth of private equity. And within, you know, even within private credit, there's a lot of different types of strategies, everything from, um, you know, middle market direct lending all the way to royalties and, and litigation finance and kind of more niche uh, credit sectors. And then kind of finally, sort of what I would deem to be the more novel or sort of, you know, asset classes of the future, if you will, it's um, things like digital assets that, that are, are becoming quite ma mainstream today. But I think in terms of advisor usage and client portfolios are still, you know, on the earlier part of that adoption cycle. Uh, so crypto, you know, being one example of kind of an uh, interesting new-ish alternative, you know, just having coming to ex in, into existence in, in the last like 13 or so years. Uh, but other things that like art and collectibles that people have been doing from a kind of hobby investing standpoint for a long period of time, but you're starting to see technology platforms, you know, take that, that experience and that and those asset classes and offer them to investors in ways where they don't have to have a million dollars to spend on a painting or a million dollars to spend on a, you know, uh, uh, mint 10, you know, yeah. Mickey Mantle rookie card or something like that, where they're essentially taking these valuable assets and securitizing them and offering fractional share access at very low minimum. So it's effectively allowing your average investor to build out a diversified allocation to something like collectibles if they were, were to want to do so, uh, you know, in a pretty efficient way. It almost feels like, like, you know, the this, this spigot has been opened like wide and there's this overwhelming all of a sudden, you know, in, in maybe three short years, there's this overwhelming, this proliferation of choices that advisors and investors have access to. And the learning curve is just, you know, it's vast. Like you hear about these new offerings like Masterworks, um, you know, the, which lets you buy fractional art. Um, you know, things like that, the novel, really novel uh, new options that investors have access to. Uh, you mentioned crypto, <laughs> you know, that seems to come and go as being sort of the most exciting option uh, in right. terms of, of uh, you know, market wide attention. But um, it's, it's yeah, for some for yeah. something that's called an alternative asset, it <laughs> sure gets a lot of uh, mainstream attention. But yeah, I think it's it's interesting in, in the sense of like, particularly some of those apps and platforms that have emerged um, trying to sort of, you know, quote, democratize access to some of these areas. It, they're almost trying to bypass the fund complex and the yeah. the sort of intermediary space and just going directly to the consumer in some of those areas. And crypto is a good example of something that almost went in, in reverse order of how most uh, alternatives go. Usually it's kind of the institution's you know, adopt first, whether it be hedge funds or private equity. And then over time, you know, the individual investor or the financial advisor community gets more involved. You know, crypto is the opposite, where it, it was really more of a, a 
kind of retail phenomenon uh and then uh, now you're now you're starting to see that that institutional adoption p- take place in somewhat kind of reverse order than than you might otherwise expect yeah how do, how do you uh, think about as these the proliferation of the different assets comes about and and they get financialized how, how do you think about the potential increase of of the correlation matrix as as things become more and more subject to sort of the traditional uh liquidity of of markets i think you have to assume the correlations will go up and i think you've, you've almost started to already see that a little bit with like bitcoin for example where you know maybe where before it had a sort of you know zero correlation to stocks now you're starting to see it behave more like a a risk asset and when you have a, a bit of a correction in the stock market um and i think that's kind of natural i think we've seen that with other you know once uh very uncorrelated assets that have since become more financialized commodities would probably be a good example there uh, as a parallel and so i think again as derivatives markets become more you know robust and, and product proliferation you know uh increases you know we'll see what happened when you know when the floodgates open if and when a, a spot bitcoin etf is, is launched in the us like i think it's only natural to assume that it, the behavior of the asset class will start to be more impacted by macro uh, events and other asset class behavior, uh, as opposed to you know marching to the beat of its own drum, as it tends to have, have done more uh, historically. Probably true for baseball cards and wine too. We, we've had, had some discussions on the wine market and whatnot, and it's it's interesting as they <clears throat> as they become financialized, they're going to go through the ebbs and flows of I think uh, market dynamics with respect to liquidity. Um, oh, it's, I think it's you know only natural to expect that when you think. I mean, the, the, probably a, a close correlation to those with the disposable income of wealthy people. And so, you know, if and when that gets disrupted by a large scale, you know, recession, then you you, you would probably expect those to uh, not necessarily provide great diversification <clears throat> benefits to, to equities in such a uh, time period. What do you, you what know? What's been? Thought? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Adam. Pierre. Go ahead. Nope. You go. I was just going to say, I, I just you know. I'm curious to know, you know, what your thoughts are on what what would happen to private equity if it became democratized, uh, you know, versus having been really sort of the stomping ground of institutions and, and, and wealthy investors. What happens if if private equity ceases to be so private? It's it's interesting in that you're, you're already starting to see the lines get a little bit blurred between the two. I think there's um, a, a number of of you know, large crossover players um, in the asset management space that it's not cut and dry that that a, a, a asset manager is a, a public market stock investor or private, you know, private equity or ventures. You know, there's a fair amount and in, an in increasing number seemingly that are doing a little bit of both. Um, and so those worlds are overlapping already. And I think there's a good likelihood, it seems, that private equity might not be as defensive in the next you know downturn as it has been in prior downturns as 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 uh multiples have really you know begun to, to skyrocket in that space just because there is so much demand there um and, and a lot of money chasing a finite amount of deals and so i think the return experience in private equity is likely going to look a lot different over the next 10 years than it has been historically um so it might not be as, as dependable as, as a diversifier um and I, and I don't think anyone should really treat Private equity as a true alternative, regardless of the environment, and that it, is, it should be, it should just be an extension of your equity portfolio, um, just illiquid in nature. And so, um, you know, I think you are starting to see it become a, you know, I, I, I hate even you hate using the word because it it's so overused these days, but democratize. But there are more on ramps to private equity through wealth management channels now, and so, you know, there is there is potential for advisors to start accessing this area in a way that they couldn't have maybe 10 years ago. Um, but I think it also begs the question, like at one point are, are you introducing multiple layers of fees, you know, th- through kind of feeder funds or access points. And then kind of like there's the, the age old question of why is this coming to me now? Yep. Who passed on this before it, you know, it, it are <laughs> finally trickled like, to with, me. With, <laughs> yeah, which of, yeah. Which, which of the large endowments or, or, you know, pensions or whoever said no to this. So, you know, I think from a kind of level playing field standpoint, it would be nice to, I mean, we've seen some relaxation and like accredited investor standards that, that open up, uh, you know, the ability to invest in, in accredited, you know, vehicles for more people. 
Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody needs to or should own private equity. I think it's kind of one of those gray areas where I think it can play a role for some, but it's not a, a blanket statement that, yes, you should or no, you shouldn't have exposure to private equity. But I think you just need to kind of treat it as part of an equity allocation. Well, are you seeing um, the sort of overlap or creep of that sort of ESG concept coming into some of these alternative investments? So, you know, you see, you talk about private debt and maybe the private debt fund is focused on, you know, impact or uh, some other, you know, sort of non, I'll say not non-financial, but more related to the ESG side. Are you seeing that sort of overlap come in either client demand wise or coming in from, from the providers? I think on the client demand side, slowly, but yes, you know, there hasn't been a wave of, of client demand of, of we've, 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 you know, we have ESG and sustainability focused solutions at, at Savant in terms of the portfolios that we offer where we, where we can have that kind of overlay or tilt. Um, but it's not our core approach. It's really more when, when there's a client request associated with it. And so I think, you know, as clients become more aware that there are these options out there that might help them align their um, social or environmental, you know, kind of values or preferences with their portfolio, that there will be some additional incremental demand. I think on the supply side, um, I mean, you guys know this as, as well as I do, like there's just a flood of, you know, anything with ESG or, you know, sustainability in the name because they, they realize um, the, the potential opportunities. So I, that, that part almost concerns me a little bit mm -hmm. just with how much is out there now that's getting kind of put, you know, some sort of label on it of ESG because I think that, you know, even within alternatives, I think I think every asset manager is just looking to figure out creatively, even if the funder strategy they're offering doesn't have an explicit ESG mandate, they're trying to figure out how do I position this in, a, in such a way that it can kind of check that box for people. So I think, you know, allocators and advisors need to really be just kind of mindful and honest about that and, and um, you know, a little bit of skepticism. A little bit of skepticism can go a long way. Sure. I think, I, I, you know, speaking of ESG and, and alternatives at the same time, um, it strikes me as, as you know, they're both, you, you're kind of experiencing the same communications issues and problems with ESG as you are with alternatives because ESG is actually so abstract and so complicated because of the 17 goals of sustainability uh, you know the UN goals, and and then and then uh, the alternatives universe is so vast, and and there's been this proliferation of of products of both on the ESG and alternatives at the same time, and then uh, you know the blended products which we, we just talked about, um, where where you have alternative products that are ESG. <laughs> you know how do you overcome like that? That's that seems to me like be. so complicated to to actually sit there for an advisor to explain to their clients how something, you know, actually does all of the above, right? And, and, and that would, to me, be, you know, I mean, it's the advisor's job, obviously, to, you know, uh, responsibility to make sure that they educate their clients on options that they feel, you know, fit into their, their, um, their portfolio. But uh, you know, it, it almost feels like like it's compounded, like the, the problem has compounded with, you know, mixing the alternatives and ESG together. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just more, you know, variables to have to consider yeah. and more things to try to decipher. And it, and it can be overwhelming both for, for advisors and for clients. And I think, you know, particularly for just like plain vanilla kind of stock funds that are focused on ESG, like you get... A million different experiences depending on like who's the index provider what yeah. is their methodology and so when you start to look under the hood at like the holdings of some of these funds like you it would probably surprise a lot of end clients to see what kind of names are in there so that's why i think packaged products are really tough from an esg standpoint because often when there's a client interest it's usually specific or related to one or two you know really you know key things that they care about and that's why i think something like direct indexing actually is probably more of a, you know, better mousetrap for someone who really wants to, uh, you know, have that alignment in their portfolio with their values is that with, with direct indexing, you can get very granular on what you want to exclude or tilt towards. Whereas when, when you're, you know, buying a mutual fund or an ETF, you're, you're just accepting that 
fund provider or that index provider's definition of what it means to be, you know, sustainability minded or environmentally conscious or, you know, whatever the, you know, niche or, or broad focus might be. Um, whereas you can affect that more at your specific, you know, direction inside of a direct indexing type type uh, a vehicle. So, so I realize your 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 you know, Phil, your book doesn't make recommendations about what to recommend, um, but you must have an opinion about certain alternatives that you like in particular, and 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 why you like them. So could you, you know, would you mind sharing a couple of, of uh, alternatives that are timely that would, that would fit nicely in, uh, in a 60-40 type of uh, situation that would provide the offset to, div you know, the diversification, I mean, to, to um, a portfolio that, that needs the introduction of alternatives? Sure. Yeah. I mean, without getting specific into funds, I would say, you know, when we look at our, our current portfolios at Savant, there's really five alternative asset classes that we include as a complement to a, a traditional portfolio. And those areas are, are things that we can implement for clients regardless of size because we're, we're accessing them through either liquid vehicles like mutual funds or, or you know, call it semi-liquid, you know, vehicles like interval funds where there aren't any restrictions around having to be a qualified purchaser or an accredited invest investor to own them. And so if we kind of narrow the universe to things under that umbrella, you know, the, the five key areas that we focus on today are, you know, one being uh, managed futures uh, or trend following, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Yep. But just, you know, for us, that's a, you know, compelling diversifier because of its uh, historical reliability when at the worst, mo you know, crisis moments for equities. So kind of offering that diversification when you want it most. Uh, and having a, a sort of unique behavioral component as to why trends and and, uh, and such exist across asset classes. And so I think the ability to go long short across different asset classes and the ability to offer diversification exactly when you'd want it makes managed futures um, something that I think should be a core diversifier uh, within an alts mix. Uh, something like uh, catastrophe bonds is another area where that's really a kind of a, a one of few structurally uncorrelated asset classes that is not impacted by you know, credit spreads or, or inflation or equity market valuations. And so that's an interesting category for us as well. Uh, direct lending, middle market direct lending. We like that as a alternative to publicly traded high yield bonds or leveraged loans. I think you're just get, you're being compensated much more from a yield standpoint than you are in public markets. And, and that's, you know, it, it, with traditional fixed income being challenged, the, the fact that middle market lending is floating rate in nature um, and offering a little bit more substantial yield uh, currently than public markets. That's a compelling one to us as well. I would say broadly speaking, real assets. So real estate, infrastructure, farmland, timberland, offering some level of uh, stable income as well as inflation sensitivity that, you know, could be valuable uh, if this trend, you know, recent trend continues. And then I'll, I'll wrap it up with the, the fifth category being event driven, which is uh, just a compilation of different trading strategies around corporate events, the most commonly known being merger arbitrage, where effectively right. you're trying to capture a, you know, sort of liquidity premium associated with uh, capital market events. And so uh, we like that as a diversifier as well. So I was wondering the, um, I mean, we all espouse the case for alternatives, but I, I'd, I'd love to hear you articulate why you think the time has come for people to really consider adding to the alternative sleeves in portfolios. Um, and then in the, con I always like to say, nobody finds God on prom night. And this has been a decade for the record books for U.S. equities and U.S. balance portfolios. So how do you make an effective argument to investors after their traditional balanced portfolios have treated some so well um, that they should begin to reduce exposure to those um, sleeves in favor of these products, um, many of which have, have lagged those basic balanced portfolios um, over that same decade. I'm just, what are some of the more effective ways that you found to communicate the value of, of these um, alternatives right now in the context of 
you know, the last few years of market conditions. Sure. And I, I think it's understandable for a investor who their existing posture has been that kind of classic 60-40, especially if it's been one with a, a pronounced, you know, U.S. equity home bias. It has treated them very well. I think we need to, you know, understand why it, it has become a bit of a security blanket, both for advisors and the clients in them, because why would you actively seek to, to move away from something that's done very well for you is very easy to understand and can be implemented extremely cheaply. Like it, yep. it checks a lot of boxes of what people would like in a portfolio. I think what's been helpful for us is, is illustrating the prospective returns uh, for that same portfolio, you know, demonstrating to clients and showing them like the return experience of the last 10 years has been above average significantly, not only in just nominal, you know, return numbers, but on a risk adjusted basis as well. It's been probably one of the best times in history to, to have, have owned such a portfolio. Um, but I think what's helpful is really kind of showing them, uh, the, particularly for the 40 piece in a 60, 40, the math and how, you know, closely your starting yield impacts your long-term performance of the bond sleeve. And I think that math is, is a little bit sobering at the moment. And so I think purely from a, a kind of here and now standpoint, understanding that the, you know, the, the elevated stock market valuations blended with a, um, you know, historically low yield environment. It's not often in history that we get that kind of um, dual effect of, 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 you know, really expensive stocks and, and low bond yields. Usually it's one or the other. Um, so really, really do you have both kind of pointing towards a future that's nothing to be too optimistic about. Similarly, I think if you just sort of take a step back with clients and say, forget about low bond yields, forget about elevated stock market valuations, let's, let's assume everything's fairly priced and you can get a, a decent yield on fixed income, is there still a case for alternatives? And I think the answer is yes, in the sense that the objective of the allocator, you're ultimately trying to make the best use of the raw materials you have access to and combine them in a way that you think gives you the best odds of achieving a particular objective. And so 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that sort of universe of raw materials or elements that we could combine together in a portfolio was narrower. There weren't as many types of alternatives that we had a, a, a exposure to or access to, and that's changed. And so I think that we should always expect our portfolios to be evolving with the times and just to try to maximize the benefit we can get from blending together different asset classes that have different features and characteristics that can complement one another well. And so I think we want to preach the benefits of diversification and 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 try to paint a picture of, of a future that may not look like the past. And I, I, I think a couple analogies, I mean, analogies are always helpful with end clients because you try to, it just kind of helps provide a real world example of something that can help, you know, drive the concept <clears throat> home. So a couple of things come to mind for me. One is sports. A lot of clients, you know, like sports or are familiar with sports analogies. And so I'll use the example of a, a, a basketball team. Um, and if you're evaluating, you know, post game, like how did each player do? If you're only looking at the stat sheet and examining how many points did they score going down the lineup, you might pick out a player and say, well, geez, they probably didn't have a good game. They only scored two points. But if you go to see their steals and their rebounds and you see, oh, they well, they had five steals and they had 10 rebounds, like that paints a different picture. And that that particular player, despite not putting up a lot of points, they're still adding value to the team. And the same goes for any alternative. It might not be in your portfolio to get the highest expected return, but it's there for a reason. It's there to provide value when other things might not be working well. And so I think that can be a helpful way to, to kind of demonstrate when, when you're trying to get people to think more from a team or an overall portfolio standpoint, as opposed to line item by line item or asset class by asset class is one. And then I like to use the example of like the iPhone. Um, we're now on the what, like 13th version of the iPhone. And if you, you know, put side by side the original versus the 13th today, like nobody in their right mind would take the the original iPhone as their their preferred phone. If you think about the the um, core functionality of both, very much a lot of the same things you can do, like make phone calls, text message, surf the internet. But the one today can do a lot more. And I would say the same goes for portfolios. Like, yeah, absolutely. We can build you a, a 60-40 portfolio. And that was largely the, the kind of common practice 20 years ago. We can do more for you today. 
there's other tools in our toolkit that we have that we think can give you a, a more robust uh, investment experience that's going to have a better likelihood of achieving returns regardless of the the economic or, or market environment that we're in. So, you know, if we, ha if we have the ability to build a better portfolio, why would we lean on the one that, you know, has, has you know, shortfalls or, or, you know, to it that we don't think are optimal? So I think that, that kind of, you know, you don't necessarily notice the big changes, you know, iPhone 2 to iPhone 3, but when you compare iPhone 1 to iPhone 13, man, it's a much more powerful, you know, product. And, and same goes for, I think we can, you know, maybe not as dramatic, but I think, you know, we can go a long way towards building better portfolios using uh, certain types of alternatives than we could if we were limited to stocks and bonds alone. My favorite metaphor, um, just bringing sports back in, is, you know, Chris Cole wrote a full report on um, Dennis Rodman yeah, in his yeah. edition. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that where, you know, if you were just to look at his um, his points scored or, you know, some of the more traditional stats, then you'd wonder why it would, would, would have him on, on the team, especially given the amount of drama that he caused. Um, I think on you could say he, course, safely but, say he course. was a long, long vol. <laughs> yeah, definitely long ball, right. <laughs> but it was just amazing when you recognize the power of the second chance points that you got from his just, you know, six standard deviation um, excess performance in his rebounding, right? Just just rebounding the ball, kicking a kick back out and giving guys a second chance. And uh, the impact that had on the game, I mean, it it just speaks so directly to the power of alternatives and especially certain types of alternatives in the portfolio that tend to have their best months when, for example, traditional portfolios have their weakest months, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, the, um, the traditional portfolio that they, they're shooting, um, they have a misfire and, you know, so the traditional portfolio goes down substantially, but the alternative gets a rebound. They go up substantially. And then they, the, the mm -hmm. alternative kicks some capital over to the traditional portfolio via rebalancing, <laughs> right, at the right time. And then you're able to, to get the best of both worlds by getting this second chance to reinvest in the traditional portfolio with more capital because you're taking money from the alternative sleeve at, um, at an opportune time. So it's just a really good, I find that to be a really effective way to communicate a um, specific example of the benefits of alternatives. So I, I like that. And I think in, in general, like if you're an advisor thinking about how to communicate or demonstrate the value of alternatives to clients, try try to find like real, it doesn't have to be those two examples of sports or the iPhone, but just look for ways to make it real and, and, and draw an analogy to something else that they can, you know, kind of more more quickly, you know, um, latch on to. You find, do you, yeah, and, and, then, <clears throat> and then just, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to do that repeatedly. Because if you have a good suite of diversifiers, there's always going to be that line item in the portfolio mm -hmm. that looks like dog's breakfast just before it probably becomes something that is a meaningful contributor to um, diversity in the way that you would like it to be rather than the way you don't like it to be. You know, diversification is something that means it's moving in a different direction than the other things. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I think, too, like you, you can't expect to communicate this this stuff once in a meeting and expect that the next time that client comes back to see you, that they're going to remember every single word you said. Like you say, you have to be a bit of a broken record on this stuff before, you know, it's going to take a number of at-bats and repetitions before it starts to, to sink in. So you have 50 ways to say mm -hmm. the same thing. You keep at, you keep yep. getting the <laughs> same question. Why? Why should yeah. I do this? So. Yeah. I was I, I was just going to say that that um, one point that I uh, wondered about was, you know, a, a lot of a lot of uh, you know professionals reach a limit in their lifetime of learning, and then you know they stop and they hang on to you know maybe what are arcane ideas about investing, and even though you know they're being flooded with new ideas, their excuse for not necessarily learning about those new ideas is that what they own isn't broken or what they're doing isn't broken yet. And, you know, right. you know, that seems, my guess is that, that that's a fairly significant cohort of advisors that are, you know, resistant to change or resistant to 
to uh, learning uh, and then changing. <laughs> I mean, the, how often do you yeah, want it? I mean, they say they say they say, you, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It, 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 it it's you know I, I think the longer someone's been doing some something a certain way, the harder yeah. it's going to be to get them to really get excited about like significant yeah. so change. When, so Phil, when um, you run into those folks that coat, you know that that person who fits into that mold what do you do to break them from that mold uh you just spend yeah. time with them yeah i, I think <laughs> you know, like say, for the same reason that sitting down with a client's gonna you know take multiple repetitions for for, for certain concepts to to really sink in yeah i think you got to appreciate where the advisor is coming from and, and know why why they feel the way they yeah. do but just again just put put in the effort and that's that's why i'm here that's why i, I have the role i do is just to be that resource and and so i'm you know just trying to you know continue you know i've only been here not even two years now but yeah i'm just continually trying to get to know our advisor base as, as much as i can and figure out what their pain points are and, and kind of meet yeah. them where they are um and, and you know all we can do is is do our best and and provide as much education and resources as we can and, and eventually hope that it sticks. And my, my other question is, is it, is it more often the clients or is it the advisor that's holding up progress? Uh, it could be yeah. both, <laughs> you know, it, it, it sort of depends. I mean, there's definitely, you know, as much as we, we do have a central, you know, it's not each advisor off building their own portfolios. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the advisors that we have at Savant, you know, tend to be very much CFP uh, types where, where they're, they're not excited about selecting funds and building portfolios. They happily outsource that responsibility to me and my team. It's not what they want to be doing or how they want to be spending their time. They want to be doing financial planning work and, and building and maintaining relationships. And so they're excited that, that they've got me and my team to be the ones behind the scenes um, you know, building the, the the different types of models and things like that that we offer at the firm. And so, you know, we try to be a little bit flexible and then we've got different versions of our models that might, you know, that, that can maybe be tailored to, to clients that have certain preferences around liquidity or preferences around, you know, the use or, or lack thereof of alternatives. So we, we understand like, it, you know, we have our, our default portfolios uh, that, that we think represent the best thinking of, of our Savant Investment Committee and research team, but we also want to be flexible, uh, you know, and understand that there are going to be some, you know, situations or use cases where, again, kind of back to that, that idea earlier, the, the best portfolio being the one the client can stick with. There might be some clients where they're, they're just more comfortable sticking with a stock bond mix. Um, and that might work for them, you know, even if we don't think it's optimal, uh, from our standpoint. Yeah. I, th I think the, the, the idea of the allocator's edge, does in itself have some sort of, I don't know, it seems somewhat obvious in plain sight if you're following, you know, sort of the broad best practices and no, there's nothing against best practices, but best practices do sort of connote you have the average portfolio. And if you have the average portfolio of best practices, you shouldn't expect anything but, you know, sort of results that mimic what everybody else is doing. And if you're actually looking for an edge, you have to think about how you're, you know, <clears throat> applying that edge. How are you going to consistently apply that? How are you, what are you going, what are you going to do that's different? I.e. you're going to have different results than everybody else. And, and how are you going to be able to behaviorally cope with that? Um, I think are all just really important parts of the equation uh, to think about both as an advisor and then advisor advising the clients because the clients don't always realize some of the some of the true nature of the decision making they're involved in at times uh, but you as a fiduciary really have that obligation to sort of continue to broaden the client's perspective and push them to the edge of the of their potential um a comfort zone to some degree in order to you know, come away with the best solution for whatever the objective function they're trying to realize is. Absolutely. And, and I would say, yeah, I mean, the, the title of the book being The Allocator's Edge, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil too much because I want people to read the book, but the, the allocator's edge in the book is not a specific 
portfolio prescription of, oh, you should own right. X percent of alternatives and it should be these mm -hmm. particular categories and these specific funds. The edge itself is really more of a, a behavior and a mindset and a set of characteristics that as an allocator you should have when, when thinking about how to build portfolios. And so I think the advisors and other professionals who are going to gravitate to the book are the ones that are actively seeking the, the, to do better for their clients than the status quo that, that you know, really, you know, want to not just continue to lean on this, the security blanket of 6040 because it's worked, but they actively want to understand this, this wide universe a little bit better um, and have that confidence and conviction to, to make change. And so, you know, it's understandable that it's going to take a little bit of education, but I think the ones that are proactive about it and that have the interest and the passion, I think hopefully they'll, they'll get a lot out of the book in that sense. So, just coming back, so we talked a little bit about why. We touched on the why. <clears throat> There's, you know, low yields, high valuations, you know, all kinds of stuff like that going on. We talked about the five major categories of, of the what. And then we've touched on behaviorally how, um, uh, you know, consulting with the client, how, what, what, other, what other hows are there that, that you can give as sort of broad-based um, uh, advice or tips to those allocators uh, as as they think about this problem, and obviously they're going to use the the tips you the flesh you provide for the bones of the book, because I'm sure they're all going to run out and get this on Amazon. It's a is it a, it's a bestseller, isn't it? It's a bestseller in finance category, I think, or something it's, like that. Uh, it's currently the number one new release in its category. Yeah, there you right. go. That's so I'm, excited <clears> about I'm sure that. everyone's going to get out there and buy this immediately. But just to add a little flesh. What have we missed on the? I think we've 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 kind of really we've we've uh, got the why. Uh, we we have talked about the what and, and some some ideas to think about there. And I thought it was very informative. Your first part of, you know, here's the things that came back on the survey, you know, worried about inflation, worried about low growth, worried about low rates. Why do I have alternatives? Sort of <laughs> answers itself a little bit. So that was awesome. But what else have we missed in the how? Yeah, in the how. So, so there's really three chapters in the how. Um, and one, we, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier when we talked about, you know, different fund structures like interval funds and there's a chapter on, on kind of containers and contents. And so I think it's important when you're allocating to alternatives, you need to have a, a fund wrapper or structure that is appropriate for the underlying asset class or holdings. Um, most importantly is, is not having a, Ill a liquidity mismatch of sorts. And so there are a handful of categories you can do fairly well inside of a, a daily liquid vehicle. There are others where it's more appropriate for something that has periodic liquidity windows, but could still you know, retain some of the characteristics of, of other registered funds. And then there's other asset classes like private equity um, that, that, you know, generally are just going to kind of have to be more of that kind of true illiquid, um, you know, wrapper. So I think first is just having a better understanding of what are the different types of wrappers out there and what's the nuance between them. Um, so I think most advisors are pretty familiar with the kind of ins and outs of mutual funds and ETFs, but maybe less so with interval funds and tender offer funds and, you know, non-treated REITs and non-treated BDCs and things like that, and just the mechanics of, of limited partnership vehicles and what all that looks like in terms of, of capital calls and commitment pacing and things like that. So that chapter, the whole chapter on kind of just kind of continuing to uh, educate on that front. Um, the other is just like when you're, you know, there, there's no, you know, as much as maybe 6040 isn't the answer going forward, it doesn't necessarily mean there's one answer, you know, to that. I think there, there's many different answers. I think it really it's just figuring out how, what are the objectives that you are trying to achieve on behalf of your clients and, and figuring out an alternatives allocation that makes sense uh, there. So I think a couple of decisions are really key and important. One is sizing the allocation and two is sourcing it. And that's going to be a function of, of A, what categories are you interested in allocating to? Um, will we'll inform the size of the alts bucket as well as is where you're taking it from. Is it coming from stocks? Is it coming from bonds? Is it coming from some combination of the two? I think generally speaking, it more often than not, it's going to come from some combination of the two, but not necessarily always. And then in terms of sizing, um, you know, it's going to vary. I think it, it needs to be enough to matter and to make a difference, uh, but maybe not so high of an allocation that it's going to kind of test the boundaries of what clients can stick with. And so that's going to be a, a a decently wide range. And I think that's going to vary by advisor to advisor on what that, you know, sweet spot is for them. And then I think with alternatives, there's just a, ho a host of other considerations to have to really put a closer magnifying glass on 
relative to traditional investments, things like due diligence, things like tax consequences, things like costs. So it's just other kind of factors throughout the diligence, you know, process to, to consider that, you know, that you're, you're going to be doing for any, any fund or manager that you're evaluating. Uh, but, but there's just, there's kind of more moving parts and a bit more complexity with, with certain alternative categories as well as more dispersion. I think that's another key thing too. I think, you know, if you look at the universe of large cap U S stock managers, you know, relatively tight bands of, of over and under performance relative to the, the index for the category, whereas, you know, pick your favorite liquid all category, you get, a, I think, a much wider dispersion of returns from your top uh, and bottom performing managers. But then you also get uh, a varying mix of, of kind of beta and correlation within those as well. And that's the other tough challenge with alternatives is it might have alternative in the name, but if you really kind of peek under the hood, it might just be really expensive beta exposure. And so I think that's another thing that advisors need to be careful about is, you know, the, the past returns might look great, but it could have just been because of the rising tide of, you know, equity markets that have buoyed returns. And so I think, you know, really just not being too trusting that it's going to behave in an uncorrelated fashion just because it, you know, belongs to a certain morning start category. I think it really, you need to go beyond that. I think that that, uh, that whole subject at the end there, <coughs> Phil, is probably the topic for a, a whole other hour. Yeah. Uh, the idea of structure I mean, uh, how many times have we all seen the, the, the right product put in the wrong structure? Disaster, right? Mm -hmm. That happens all the time. Taxation, another great point. And then as you say, you know, you're, you're looking for an alternative manager and you're like, wow, this alternative manager, look at how it's just done so great when all the other alternative managers haven't because it, it wasn't alternative. It was just in the beta that you thought you were trying to sort of get an alternative right. exposure to so every everything you thought you were moving away from yeah. from you were actually just maintaining but just paying a premium for exactly it. exactly yeah. so i think we we should probably uh we've been at this for about an hour and uh i think we've covered the stuff the the, the key com contents of the book and i think uh we'll, we'll have uh another visit with you at some point down the road where we dig into maybe more deeply some of the the topics that have uh uh, Hopefully, over pints in here. Chicago. That's yeah, right. no, I, I would, I would love to return at some point. It's, it's always uh, a pleasure to chat with you guys and, and uh, a lot of fun. So, uh, where can people you, find you, Phil? Uh, you can find me in a few, a few spots. As uh, I'm, I'm fairly active on Twitter, and my handle is at Bips and Pieces, uh, BPS and yep. Pieces, and then uh, that's also the name of my blog. So, BipsandPieces.com is the blog. Uh, you can find the new book. You know pretty much wherever books are sold, but I would say Amazon sh probably should be your starting point uh, as most uh, books are sold there today. And then my uh, our, our company uh, website is savantwealth.com. That will all be in the show notes. Yeah. Brilliant. So, Phil, okay. congrats. <clears throat> Phil, thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations on, on uh, your book. Uh, congratulations on the Allocator's Edge. Um, it's a really timely book. It was it was about time someone published a detailed and insightful look at the universe of alternative investments and where they fit, most of which were not available to investors just a few years ago as they are today. Phil, thank you so much for your time. It's been really a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me and, and would love to come back one day.